tonight. Consequence-free harassing in Washington, D.C. Egypt's LGBT crackdown. And the secret of Trump's millennial judge. Dueling leaders showed up for work this morning at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Leandra English, who was tapped by director Richard Cordray when he abruptly stepped down on Friday, and Mick Mulvaney, named by President Trump that same day. Mulvaney has criticized the agency's very existence, and English is a founding staffer. Last night, she filed a lawsuit to block Mulvaney from taking over. But this morning, Mulvaney emailed agency staff and told them to disregard any of her instructions. He brought donuts to the office, too. English also emailed CFPB employees to thank them for their service and signed off as acting director. A firebrand cleric in Pakistan has officially ended a weeks-long sit-in that paralyzed the country's major cities, turned violent at moments, and led to at least six deaths. Kadim Rizvi and his tens of thousands of followers started the protest because of a proposal to revise the oath that lawmakers take. That version didn't include a reference to Prophet Muhammad. Officials quickly backpedaled on the change, but Rizvi didn't concede until the government minister, who was blamed for the new text, was removed from office. The Indonesian government has ordered 100,000 people to evacuate the area near Bali's Mount Agung, which started erupting yesterday. Officials are anticipating a major eruption and raised the highest level of alert. Authorities are warning of dangerous cold lava flows, which carry mud, large boulders, and volcanic debris. More than 1,500 people were killed the last time the volcano erupted, in 1963. Scientists have confirmed that an attempt to transplant and grow coral on a damaged area of the Great Barrier Reef worked for the first time. Australian researchers started the experiment in November 2016, when they took coral egg and sperm, helped it to spawn, and planted it back on the reef. A year later, the team found that those baby corals took hold successfully, which could mean scientists have tapped into a new way to restore reefs that are under threat from climate change and warmer sea temperatures. At a ceremony to honor Native American code talkers who served in World War II, President Trump repeated a racial slur that he's previously used to describe Senator Elizabeth Warren. The Massachusetts Democrat had no connection to the event. You were here long before any of us were here. Although we have a representative in Congress who they say was here a long time ago. They call her Pocahontas. But you know what? I like you because you are special. It's been 53 days since Harvey Weinstein was first accused of being a serial sexual harasser and predator, setting off a wave of misconduct allegations that swept away actors, directors, comedians, journalists, tastemakers, restaurateurs, technologists, and, of course, politicians. Many of these men have apologized or begged forgiveness, including Al Franken at a press conference on Monday. I know that... I've let a lot of people down, uh, people of Minnesota, my colleagues, uh, my staff, my supporters, and everyone who has um, counted on me to be a champion for women. To all of you, I just want to uh, again say I am sorry. But while Weinstein and others appear to be permanent pariahs, more Franken and Conyers have vocal defenders and potentially zero consequences. Columnist Michael Kinsley defined the political gaffe as when a politician accidentally tells the truth. And that's exactly what Nancy Pelosi did on Meet the Press Sunday. She accidentally told the truth when asked about sexual misconduct accusations against Democratic Congressman John Conyers. That's because someone is accused you, and, and was it one accusation? Is it two? I think there has to be. John Conyers is an icon in our country. He has done a, gr a great deal to protect women at the Violence Against Women Act. To state the obvious, Pelosi is both a Democrat and a woman. So why on earth is she being so accommodating of a man who was accused by multiple women of sexual harassment 
and who settled a claim about it with taxpayer money in secret. One reason is that the evidence against Conyers came from right-wing agitator Mike Cernovich, just as the evidence against Bill Clinton back in the day came from right-wing agitator Lucianne Goldberg. It's always easy to dismiss a horrific claim against your guy if you can cite a conspiracy from the other side. But there's an easier explanation. It's because Pelosi's a politician. And for decades, politicians have excused all sorts of outrageous and even criminal behavior by members of their own party. No one in modern politics got away with more than Ted Kennedy. The death of Mary Jo Kopechny, a Kennedy aide who died in Senator Ted Kennedy's car. They have Beyond the whole leaving woman to die Chappaquiddick thing, there were numerous stories of Senator Kennedy misbehaving with women, often while drunk and often in public. He didn't really suffer any political consequences, and he died the so-called liberal lion of the Senate. In 1991, not a single Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee voted against Clarence Thomas. He spoke about acts that he had seen in pornographic films involving such matters as women having sex with animals. Despite the fact that if you believe Nita Hill, he engaged in the very textbook definition of sexual harassment while heading of all things, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And no Republican voted to oust David Vitter in 2007 after he confessed to using prostitutes. It's pretty simple, really. These guys, and it's always guys, remain beyond real consequences precisely because the politics itself has become so consequential. For example, Alabama is a lock to turn red again in four years when the next Senate election rolls around. But Senate voting margins are so tight right now that no one wants to concede the special election battle over Roy Moore and lose a future war over the Supreme Court seat or a tax bill. Conyers is in one of the safest, bluest seats in the country, but no one wants to squander his decades of accumulated power. And so Pelosi, Trump, and almost everyone else, they rationalize. Almost everyone else. In 1995, Republican Senator Bob Packwood was forced to resign after it was discovered that he was a secret groper and harasser. Republican Senator Mitch McConnell was on the Senate Ethics Committee at the time, and he was pretty key to pushing a resistant Packwood out the door. This is how McConnell described that whole mess during the height of the Clinton impeachment brouhaha. Republicans had to choose between retaining the Senate seat or retaining our honor. I believe the women, yes. Most recently, the old Republican conservative male Southerner McConnell has called for the old Republican conservative male Southerner Roy Moore to get lost too. It's not clear yet how Democrats are planning on rationalizing that one. The Trump administration is nominating judges at breakneck speed, which could reshape the judiciary for decades to come. But one of Trump's latest picks doesn't exactly fit the profile of a federal judge. This is Brett Talley. He's 36. He's only practiced law for three years. He used to write speeches for Mitt Romney, and he's married to a Trump administration lawyer. In his spare time, he's hunted ghosts as a paranormal investigator. He writes horror novels. He's also the likely author of 16,381 posts on a forum for University of Alabama football fans. What he hasn't done is try a case in court. Just a few years ago, judges still made him nervous, as he told the student group. Or, you know, standing up in front of judges and answering their questions, um, where they're just like, you know, they're, they're pounding you with questions and you're having to come up with answers on your feet. Tally does have two things going for him. He's young and he's conservative. So Donald Trump nominated him to a federal judgeship in September. And even though the American Bar Association unanimously rated him, quote, not qualified because of his lack of experience, the Senate has voted to move forward with his nomination. The clerk will now call the roll on Mr. Talley. Mr. Chairman, the votes are 11 yeas, 9 nays. With the majority supporting the nomination, Mr. Talley will be reported. If he's confirmed, Talley's got a job for the rest of his life. And Trump's banked a conservative judge in the Middle District of Alabama, two steps below the Supreme Court. Talley represents one of the few areas where Trump has been truly effective, remaking the federal judiciary. Trump has already nominated 59 judges since taking office, more than twice the number Obama had nominated by the same time in his first term. Like Talley, Trump's nominees tend to be young. His appeals court candidates are two and a half years younger than Obama's on average. And they're all conservative. 
many hand-picked by the Federalist Society. Sheldon Goldman wrote the book on federal judicial nominations. Previous Republican presidents have been very concerned about appointing conservatives who will reverse more liberal judicial decisions of the Supreme Court. And being a member of the Federalist Society is a mark of one's commitment to conservatism. Trump sees this as a simple way to have a long-term effect on the federal courts. The judge story is an untold story. Nobody wants to talk about it. But when you think about it, Mitch and I were saying, that has consequences 40 years out, depending on the age of the judge, but 40 years out. It's something Republican administrations have long been better about than Democrats. There's an added bonus for Trump. He only needs 51 votes because Democrats got rid of the judicial filibuster in 2013, in part because Republicans were blocking all their nominees. We will see a movement to, I think, more radical conservative stance. And I think there are going to be really earth-shattering consequences for the judiciary and judicial policy. The House Oversight Committee will hold a meeting on the national opioid crisis tomorrow in Baltimore, which makes a poignant choice of venue. The city has been flooded with heroin for decades, and as many as one in 10 residents is addicted. But fatal overdoses are spiking in Baltimore largely because the heroin is often cut with fentanyl, which is 50 to 100 times more potent, but varies in amount from batch to batch. Bad batches are killing so many people that one resident, along with a team of young programmers and a grant from the city, created an emergency text alert system for mass overdose events. Can I give you guys a card? Huh? It's called Bad Bachelor. It's trying to help people stay alive out here on the streets of Baltimore. Oh, okay. If you ever got like a, uh, I can tell you about it if you're curious. No, I ain't got time. You don't have time? All right. I'd love to tell you about it if you have a sec. Bad Bachelor. Uh, yeah. Here's a poster. Yeah. It's a new text program trying to help people stay alive out here in Baltimore City. You ever get like a flash flood warning on your phone or a Amber Alert? Mm-hmm. You get one of those? So same idea, but instead of giving you a warning when there's a flash flood, it gives you a warning when a group of people have overdosed nearby you. I'd be happy to sign you up if you're, if you're interested in getting the alerts. You can warn anybody that might be using, you can try and keep people safe. Oh, okay, so I can sign up right on my phone? Yeah, I, if you give me your phone number, I could register for you since you have your hands full. You don't know how much is in those pills. I mean, I, I, I was... I was a user, and yeah. I've been cleaning for almost 12 years now, so... Wow, yeah. good job. Yeah. Hmm. I had a longtime friend of mine, and she'd always struggled with heroin. And then last summer, uh, she overdosed and died in Florida. And when I went down to the funeral, I learned, like, some of the details about it. Uh, they started mixing car fentanyl, which is the one that's even stronger than fentanyl. And then it moved to the next county, and there was no way to warn people that the same batch was there killing all these you know, new group of people. If we know that there's something out there that's killing a bunch of people, why can't we warn those people? So, so there's a ton of things we're trying to get done today. You guys, have you guys all met Amanda? Everybody knows Amanda? We were actively working with the Baltimore City Fire Department um, to get their emergency medical system data. So I was analyzing all of that data, and I was connected with Mike Legrand and Code in the Schools to try to address the issues that we were facing with overdose in the city. The cool thing is that they're looking at their phone and they're being reminded that this exists, and when they're ready to get information about services, Mm. you know, the, the service is there. Every time somebody overdoses, EMS shows up and they have to fill out a bunch of paperwork on you know, what happened. That gets entered into the computer. The health department then runs the numbers on what gets sent to them. Uh, when that happens, they notify us and we can craft the message and mass send it out to everybody that's registered in that region. And we added a lot of features that we didn't really think of initially, like uh, integrated a lot of stuff, connecting people to the needle exchange vans. 
hopefully they come for the alerts, but once they're in, they kind of interact with some of the other services. Yes, I am. Yeah, I know you've been around here a long time. Right. So you don't have any syringes today? No, sir, but I need some, though. So you need your, uh, you need a tourniquet? Yeah. I started when I was 13 years old, and uh, I loved it, and I've been doing it ever since. Okay. I love that fentanyl. You love it? Love it, because it's a guarantee high. Guaranteed. You just gotta respect it. If you don't respect it, it'll kill you. The attitude that people will try to use the service to seek out rather than uh, avoid dangerous drugs, you have to do a lot to safeguard against it. Even if someone did have bad intentions, knowing that whatever they're seeking out is lethal, more lethal than you know what's normal, one would hope that they would take appropriate precautions. The problem is so big, this is really just chipping away at, at the fringes of it. I think it will make a difference because we'll have a chance to at least give a warning to the people when we know that they are in danger, in immediate danger of death. Over the weekend, Egypt sentenced 14 men to three years in prison. They're charged with having, quote, abnormal relations, which is code for being homosexual. The sentencing comes during a massive crackdown by the Egyptian government on the LGBTQ community. Lawmakers are considering the world's most expansive anti-gay bill ever. Not only would it criminalize homosexuality, but even showing support for gay rights, like carrying the rainbow flag, would be a crime. And at a concert in September, police arrested at least 60 people on charges of inciting debauchery and homosexuality. The band headlining that night was Mashru Leila, whose frontman identifies as queer. Vice News met up with the Lebanese indie pop group to talk about gay rights in Egypt. It's going to be really polarizing for people, which is kind of strange. Like People either really, really, really like it or they want you to die. Our songs, some of it is related to the environment, some of them are related to women's rights. But we've inadvertently become a queer core boy band. And I don't know why this particular subject is always like the center of the attention. And that's part of what is so sort of depressing about this Egypt thing. We're super excited for the show. We knew that it, it was going to be a big show. 35,000 people screaming your, your songs. I remember there's one song where we ask people to turn on their torchlights. It was just a sea of stars in front of us. It was just beautiful. A couple of rainbow flags went up in the audience. I mean, it was like a, maybe a meter and a half by a meter inside the sea of people, you know? But no one had a problem with it because people were just there to be themselves. تم القبض على احمد علاء وصراح جازي من مسكنهم تم التحقيق معاهم وتوجيه اتهامات الانضمام لجماعه ارهابيه واسست على خلاف القانون والدستور هدفها تجدير السلم الاجتماعي المشكلة بس ان هو نزل الصورة ديت على الفيس وعشان كده عامل الضجة كبيرة جدا بس انت لا تعلن عليا ان ده حرية شخصية لا كله بيهجم عليه الدولة المجتمع خايف جدا حاسس ان هو ممكن لو نزل الشارع ممكن يتقتل حاليا في حملة تشويه بتتمارس عليا تحريض عليا وعلى اهلي 
في القتل والسحل والضرب بدايه من القريه اللي انا منها وينشر الفحشاء هي فحشاء وجرم وجريمه وعار واللي يتكلم عنه ويدافع عنهم عار زيهم الحفل ده اقيم اساسا بتدعو الى الشذوذ الجنسي والشواذ جنسيا بيدعو الى انهم لهم حقوق وان المجتمع لازم يقبلهم لان دي حريه شخصيه من هنا انا تقدمت ببلاغ طبعا هذا الفعل او الاباحيه في الاعلان عن الشذوذ دي مجرمه ف ودي في الشريعه اساسا عقابها الموت رفع علم الرينبو في حد ذاته مش جريمه وما فيش نص بيجرم رفع العلم او التضامن مع الاشخاص I really doubt that the government actually thinks there was a 35000 person satanic gay orgy The government How do you fuck with 35000 sorry it's just like it's it's really strange the idea of a 35000 person orgy is just like The same thing happened in Jordan as well when whatever the media is saying, which is these, this band is a group of Satanists or a group of homosexuals or whatever. And, But uh, even, even then, let's assume that we were all homosexuals. No, but... All right? There's this really weird idea that like, oh, if those people are playing on stage, that everyone's going to magically turn gay. But that, that is sort of part of the panic that's been generated in the press, I'd say. Ahmed... Uh... محطوط وضعه يعني وضع احتجازه انفرادي قاعد في التأديب حلقه له شعره What happened with Egypt is something that shocked us all. I mean we were all depressed for a week. Just the scale of this. The sort of unabashed bluntness of the aggression. Right? No one's trying to be diplomatic about it. We are arresting you because you are it. suspected of being non-heterosexual. Here's the violence that ensues. I'm Andre Asselman, the author of the novel Call Me By Your Name. I am Luca Guadagnino. I am the director and co-producer of Call Me By Your Name, the movie. Call Me By Your Name is a novel about the love of two individuals. One is 17 years old, the other one is 24 years old. It happens sort of unpredictably, and yet it blossoms and it develops, and it stays with them for the rest of their lives. It's April of 2005. I'm supposed to go to Italy. I just find out that I'm not going to go to Italy. I'm very unhappy and very frustrated. So I start writing a novel that is going to be happening in Italy. And I begin to think of a house. I think of a beach. And I think of a pine alley that leads to the house. And sure enough, if you have a pine alley, then you have a car coming in. And when the car comes in, I have to decide who is going to come out of the car. Professor Perlman. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. You're, you're bigger than your picture. Well, I couldn't get all of me in the photos. It's a problem. And there was always someone that made me very nervous or who intimidated me, who was older than I was. And suddenly I said, why not bring this character back? How are you? How you doing? Nice to meet you, Elliot. The idea and the concept of moving the action to my hometown, I knew the places so well that I could investigate more deeply the relationship between space and figure and make sure that we were not going for like a sort of postcard imagination of Italy in the 8th in the summer. The place is lush with fruit. There are scents all over the place and the boy takes the fruit in his bedroom and begins to eat it. And as in the movie, there's juices all over him. And basically, he applies the fruit in a place of his body that we will not name. And he ejaculates into it. And then I said, okay, Andre, I cannot believe that you wrote this scene. This is disgusting. But I, I, I decided to keep it. I like to joke about the fact that sometimes, that during the process of making the film, I also question the actual physical act that it cannot happen. I, did, I thought it wasn't possible. <laughs> and so I had to try before in order to understand. And I, I understood that it was possible, actually. 
My problem was, how do you make that individual experience a collective experience with the brutality of the images? And I really was uh, torn. I think that both the novel and the film do one thing that is so essential. There is no accident, there is no death, there is no banning of any sexual proclivity. All right, later. These are two individuals who have a relationship, and I think it should serve as a model for essentially a happy romance. That's Vice News Tonight for Monday, November 27th.